You're listening to Cloud9, where Bahaiteachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. We live in a world where everyone can feel like a photographer. Access to cameras, smartphones, and editing software has made the art of photography more accessible than ever before. While the point and shoot mentality pervades and images are being shared so widely and rapidly, one begs the question, what's left of the art of photography? Although aware of the current climate, Chicago-based photographer Nancy Wong is unperturbed. Her noble calling has enabled her to devote her life's work to facilitate connection and upliftment through the photographs she captures. Her philosophy as an artist is to visually document the inherent nobility, dignity, and beauty of the world through photography. Nancy first discovered the Baha'i faith in her youth, and some years later declared her faith in Baha'u'llah at a youth conference in Barbados, which she had attended with some friends. Her newfound faith began a lifelong exploration, finding ways to be of service to humanity by pursuing her passion in photography. In this episode of Cloud9, Nancy and I will discuss her philosophy as a photographer, how she's found her voice as an artist, and how the Baha'i Faith operates as the driving force behind her creative projects and passion for social justice. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us on Cloud9. Hi, Shadi. Thank you so much for having me. As Baha'is, one of the things that we're called to observe in one another is the spiritual identity, the attributes that we all inherently possess, our inner reality. Abdul Baha, the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, refers to the inner reality as a conscious reality which discovers the inner meaning of things. He shares that the outer body of man does not discover anything. The inner ethereal reality grasps the mysteries of existence, discovers scientific truths, and indicates their technical application. He goes on to say that it is the inner reality which comprehends things, throws light upon the mysteries of life and being, discovers the heavenly kingdom, unseals the mysteries of God, and differentiates man from the brute. As a photographer, much of your work is focused on the outer body. But I also read on your website that you're also mindful of revealing the light that is within. I'd love to learn more about how the Baha'i faith inspires you to consciously strive to convey the spiritual attributes and inner reality of your subjects through your photography. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Well, the Baha'i faith has a lot of writings and teachings that remind us who we are and what we really are, uh, which is spiritual in essence. And um, and also the writings teach us about how we should behave with each other, how we should treat one another, and in a way that benefits all of us. I remember one of my first uh, photo exhibits or pieces that I was a part of a group exhibition I had a photo piece that was called From the Same Dust. And uh, it was based on the quote that Baha'u'llah had revealed in the hidden words, which is, O children of men, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how you were created. That quote, that hidden word really inspired me. Uh, I I wanted to, one of my, the favorite things I like to take pictures of or subject is people. So with that quote, I was really inspired to just get portraits of individuals that help me think about that, that teaching that we all come from the same dust. And, you know, in that same quote, Baha'u'llah says that it's, you know, since we've created you all from the same substance, it's incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth and dwell in the same land. That from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Such is my counsel to you, O Congress of Light. Heed ye this counsel that ye may obtain the fruit of holiness from the tree of wondrous glory. I, I think, you know, upon really meditating on it and doing it visually, I realized that 
I would benefit if I actually paid attention to this. So in photography, I really think a lot about, you know, when I take pictures of people, why? Why am I so attracted? And I think it's because in essence, we come from love and we are all a part of each other. And so this is what draws me. And I I think my own history of my family coming from China and the history, the legacy of of the Chinese in the U.S. um, really probably instilled in me this sense of, you know, there are a lot of people in the world that experience what, uh, what it's like to be invisible, to not be treated in the way that God has taught us to treat each other. And so that's sort of what has inspired me to really pay attention to those, those concepts. So I really focus on beauty, dignity, um, and really about justice and equality. I, I'm really interested in being coherent in that as well. So whenever I'm taking photographs, I think about who it is that I'm taking a picture of. And even then, the Baha'i writings really have instilled in me a sense of who it is that I'm looking at. There's numerous uh, writings about how we're all created noble and that, in, in essence, we're, our souls are perfect and that we're all beautiful. This idea that there's only one kind of beauty is really, really been... I think harmful to a lot of us that there is only one kind of beauty and that you have to live up to that standard is impossible and it's never meant to be that way. So when I take photographs of people, I really try to remove some of those myths. You know, we're not all supposed to look alike. It's not meant to be that way. And uh, we all have our own unique uh, temperaments and qualities and attributes and it's meant to beautify the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I was I was actually getting emotional as you were talking. I was so inspired. <laughs> oh, Thank you. So sweet. Thank you. Now, you've had a very interesting career path that hasn't always been centered around photography. You started out by taking a few photography classes in university but decided early on that it wasn't a practical career to pursue. So instead, you completed a degree in Chinese language, which was followed by years working in pregnancy prevention and domestic violence for various nonprofit organizations, which was followed by a stint uh, working in education on behalf of the American Baha'i community for a few years. All the while, you continue to explore your growing passion for photography through evening classes And then you were invited to volunteer in the Baha'i World Center to be a staff photographer. Up until this point, you had very little to no professional experience. And this opportunity was essentially a deep dive into unknown waters. How did you feel about this whole process? What did you learn during your years of service as a photographer in the Baha'i World Center? Wow, Shadi, I was so excited. It was was a really unbelievable opportunity. I had always wanted to work internationally, to do photography internationally, and that was my chance. But I I don't know if you've ever ridden a roller coaster before, but it's kind of like the same experience where you go to the very top. And then if you look down, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And there's no way you can get off, right? (laughs) Because it's dangerous if you get off at that point. So Mm. for me, that's what that was like. I was like, oh my gosh, I get to do what it is that I've always wanted. And yet part of what was required of me was this, ah, this idea of letting go of my ego and not being afraid to be vulnerable, not being afraid to not know what I'm doing. And uh, I really, one of my models was fake it till you make it sort of, <laughs> and uh, that helped so much. Um, and to really trust that everything that I had learned and experienced and cultivated up to that point was enough for me to get through whatever it is that I needed to figure out. And so I I prayed a lot when I was there. I asked for guidance. I called towards the spiritual world for support and, um, you know, any sort of assistance that I may need if I didn't understand what was going on. I became very practical and really turned towards other people that I knew had some experience with photography there. I actually had an amazing mentor who was the photographer before me, um, who was serving there, but he was there a little bit longer to help me train in. And his name is Dean Wilkie. He was a Baha'i. He was a professional photographer. He was the best for me. 
And I think the reason why he and I worked so well was, and I really appreciated uh, his perspective, was that he is really uh, a true artist in the sense that he was very concerned about process. And he was also, I mean, aside from the technical aspects of photography, but he was also interested and very concerned about the moral character of the photographer. Uh, he wasn't judgmental, but he was like, Nancy, yeah, you can be a great photographer, but if you don't have a good character, who's going to want to work with you or hire you really? And it, it was a really important thing for me to learn about. Um, and he, he modeled that with me. He was so wonderful. We would go out on shoots together and he would really accompany me in a way that was very empowering. He was very sensitive, but very honest with me and very direct and very informative and um, edifying. He would bring in a lot of different examples of what works and what doesn't work and um, help me to get away from like going, oh, look at that photograph. I wanted to do just like that. And he would say, well, you can try, but you know, you can decide that you want to be a photographer that copies other people or you want to be a photographer that is inspired by others and maybe informed and can refer to, but that you do your own work. And Shadi, that was huge for me as an artist. I think he really understood that, you know, when you first learn something, you might copy a little just to kind of get into the groove of it, but really to find your own voice that takes, he really taught me it takes years. And, and that's, I mean, of all my artist mentors, they all talk about the same thing that it takes years. You don't just become an overnight success. And if there are people that do great for them, but like, what is it that you're supposed to learn? And he, so he helped me to really go back and look at myself and focus on myself and my own work. You've kind of spoken to this next question that I had about striving to find your own voice as a photographer. Um, but I just want to bring it back to your time at the Baha'i World Center, because some of our listeners may not have context of what that actually means and what that is. So in the Baha'i faith, we have this international headquarters, which is located in Haifa, Israel. And it's a series of administrative buildings where roughly like 800 people are voluntarily offering their time to serve in administrative, um, various administrative and physical capacities. And these individuals come from roughly 90 different countries around the world. So as your job as a staff photographer, what kind of photographs were you taking or what was your kind of day to day like? Could you briefly paint us a picture of your work there? Yeah, so it actually was probably like the best photo education I could ever have. It I was basically doing everything. I was taking photographs of buildings or architectural photography. I was taking pictures of people at events and headshots for different various needs, like even passport photos, but then also just for record and documenting the individuals that were serving there. Um, I was taking photographs of uh, when they would have construction of different Baha'i holy places. Uh, documenting the process of uh, renovation or building up a new place. Um, also documenting the process of how we were taking care of the holy relics. I loved working with a the conservator there and uh, taking, you know, photographs in the studio of different things that he was working on, whether it be a piece of furniture or a piece of um, uh, like a, like a jacket or a piece of clothing that belonged to a holy member of the Baha'i faith. So these are really special, precious items. And I was working um, also in an archival facility for the photographic material. I often had to take photographs of uh, historical prints. So I was doing a lot of what they call copy work. So all of this was within the context of a depository that was an international record of the history of the Baha'i faith. That's amazing. So you had such a diverse experience. Yes. Which is very rare for, I think, many photographers, especially when they're starting out. Now, you returned to the United States five years later, and I'd love to learn about how you were able to find your voice, because we're living in a world where technology has made the industry more accessible and complex and competitive. So in returning from the Baha'i World Center, uh, how did you how did you establish yourself as a photographer and kind of continue that learning process? Yeah, it's a great question, Shadi. It, it takes time. I think the biggest thing for me was to always carve out time so that I could just sort of be 
a little bit isolated so that I could hear my own voice and see my own work. I would expose myself to other works of art, uh, even in addition to photography, like painting and um, uh, 3D work and even animation. Uh, I just dove in and immersed myself in the art world. I think also just surrounding myself with really good people who understood art and the artistic process, the creative process, and people who were just kind, uh, who really cared and but were honest. Um, so I think that kind of crew or team or or village of people that I surrounded myself with was really important. I love being around other artists because I think also that they understand like, oh, some days you have really bad days and some days you have really great days. And I think this idea of doubting oneself is something that people I, I love it when artists aren't afraid to talk about it because I, I wish there was another word for it because in some ways I understand that it's not about doubt in the sense that you just want to throw all your talent away but it's like you kind of like forget or get a little lost and you just need a good reminder and um and it's and it's just so that you can get closer you know closer to whatever it is that you're searching for um so it's just a journey. It's that vulnerability almost. Vulnerability is so hard. And every artist, like we're, we're born thin skin so that we can take in yeah. what's in the world and try to manifest what's actually coming from a different realm, really. And so for us to, to be aware of that and have develop a, a particular kind of thick skin that's thin. <laughs> and uh and then <laughs> and then still maneuver okay, i know what you mean <laughs> yeah it's really interesting yeah it's fascinating and when i talk to artists that are really committed to the process they get it and so i, I think that was the other thing was i just had to keep focusing on process yes the work will keep improving when i keep doing more and i keep learning and i'm not afraid to ask questions and i just keep practicing and keep at it but then i also have to sort of like relax in it yeah you know it's kind of the crux of this whole podcast series cloud nine is is how the spiritual informs the 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 practice of the creation um which you've, mm -hmm. you've beautifully touched on now let's talk a bit more about some of the projects you're working on i'm really curious to learn more um i know about two years ago you started a photography project which documents families of african-american descent living in the south side of chicago you named this the Gia Project, which translates to the word family in Mandarin. Since the project's inception, you've been able to photograph over 100 families across four generations, and you've done this all on a voluntary basis. Could you share what inspired you to start the Gia Project, who you've been collaborating with, and why you are motivated to contribute to the Black narrative in America? Yeah, thanks for asking me about this. I love the Gia Project. So in 2010, I was commissioned to take photographs for FAWE, which is the Forum for African Women Educationalists. And they're based, they're an international NGO, a non-governmental organization based in Kenya. And uh, they um, have national like sister organizations throughout the continent. They wanted to have uh, photographs of different success stories from these various uh, national entities around the continent. And so they commissioned me to go to these five different countries. And so I was able to go to, they sent me to Uganda, Ethiopia, Liberia, Ghana, and Mali. And what I loved about that project, all I did was basically take pictures of these students, mostly girls, some, some boys, um, and some young women, that were beneficiaries of the Fawe projects. And it was wonderful. And, and they, were, they were all devoted to education and advancement of girls in education, as well as some boys um, that were participants. They just wanted the, the children to have an education. And so what I loved was that I was asked to take photographs of the positive things that were happening in the continent and that these were positive things that were happening uh, in projects that were overseen by Black African women. And I was really inspired by that because I knew that there was still a lot of photographs that were coming out of Africa that were not necessarily positive. Um, you know, and it's not to say that there weren't challenges that, and continues to be challenges in that continent, but 
I saw the value of and what happens when you can show a, a broader reality of what's happening to groups of people. So at the same time, I was also thinking a lot about the types of portraits that I love to do and was doing some with my own family, just taking family pictures. I remember that there was a quote uh, in the Baha'i writings that I was really inspired by. And it was uh, by Abdu Baha, who is the son of Baha'u'llah, where he says, Know ye how easily where unity exists in a given family, the affairs of that family are conducted, what progress the members of that family make, how they prosper in the world. So when I think about my own transformation and where I have sort of like glitches in my own life, I always have to kind of go back to my family and think about, okay, where did I learn this from? And what, why am I thinking this way? Why do I have this tendency to do this or do that? So I realized, wow, we learn a lot about who we are and who we're not and how to be in the world from our family. And I know that in the Baha'i faith, we're taught that the family is the smallest unit of society. And, and so I realized that thinking about that quote by Abdu Baha, I realized, wow, if we can really um, prop up families and really help support families to be strong, then that will really help individuals to be strong. And therefore, it helps a community. Um, at the same time, I had this friend who runs a nonprofit where they were doing family portraits in their community where their nonprofit was located. And it was a means to really bring people together in the community to see each other, to learn about each other. And that just sparked an interest in me. I was like, ooh. So I'm living in Chicago and Southside Chicago is predominantly, I think like 95% are African-American. What can I do to contribute? And so I had a conversation with a couple of my friends, Brian Gorman and Tiffany Gorman, a married couple. And Tiffany is a Baha'i. And so I, you know, we hung out a lot and I just had this conversation about, oh, I was trying to do this project, but I'm not sure where to go. And, oh, I'm Asian American. Does that seem weird to be taking pictures of Black families in the Black community? And so we had a lot of talk about that. And he was, you know, Brian in particular was like, come on, Nancy, let's just do it. So we started a couple of years ago and, you know, the three of us worked together to bring these families together and we just get these photographs. And meanwhile, while I was doing that, I was getting more and more exposed to why this project was important for me to do like just i would run into different talks or hear different um presentations or see different art exhibits i'm like oh this is why this is why i want to do this and why we need to continue doing it and it has to do with learning more about the history of slavery in this country um with the legacy of of slavery and and um the trauma and the assault and all the separation and really the intentional destroying of, of families and individuals um, that are from Africa, it, it really made me go, okay, you know, it's so, so fascinating to me that even despite that kind of history, that people still come together as families. I heard a presentation by Dr. Joy DeGru, who is also Baha'i and has been quite well-known expert in talking about the um, uh, traumatic slave disorder. And once I heard her say, you know, actually black people are a miracle. You know, the fact that they're able to survive slavery and still exist and still thrive. So I thought a lot about that. The other thing that I saw at an artist, uh, uh, in, uh, at an art museum, there was an artist who was talking about how she had done some research, uh, the photographs during the civil rights movement. And one thing she, two things that she noticed, one was that photojournalism uh, basically made up most of the photographs that were, that documented that time. Uh, like the people who took those photos basically were photojournalists. She realized that that type of photography and those iconic photographs have now been elevated to fine art. And she said, oh, that's really interesting. And then she said, what made it even more interesting was that the majority of those photographs were images of black and brown bodies that were suffering. So she said, I, it made me wonder, what does that do to a society that not only elevates those kinds of images to a level of fine art, but then it's these images 
conditions that are of pain and suffering of a group of people that reside in its country, you know? So I thought, wow, okay. So then again, it goes back to when I went to the continent of Africa that I took photographs that were positive. I really wanted to be able to say, hey, there's more, there's more. And I was really inspired by the photographs of James Van Der Zee and Gordon Parks and how they just took pictures of normal black folk and, you know, that were the rich and poor uh, doing family things, doing normal community things, going to church, having a funeral, um, wanting to get their family portraits taken, wanted to, you know, get their headshots taken. So I just thought, okay, I, you know, I, I want to contribute to that visual narrative as a, as a woman of color, as a photographer of color. And uh, eventually I'd love to do these photos, family portraits with the Chinese community and the Asian community. What have you learned about the concept of family through this, this project? Well, I've learned that so many people, regardless of their religion or whether or not they practice a religion, really see family as a sacred institution. Um, whether or not they term it that way, like it's really important. I also learned that, um, Family is not always a source of joy for people. Um, although the majority of the families that I have been taking photographs of have expressed that it is. They like each other. <laughs> they do. Um, but, but even when it's not a source of joy, the fact that we've opened up this um, project by saying, look, it's however you define family. And so we actually had a group of youth that came that for, they were on a missionary a project where they came together for a summer or for a year, I think. And, you know, they weren't related to each other and they, but they felt like they were family to each other. And they talked about what that meant. So when these folks come for these beautiful families and individuals come for the photo project, we actually ask them uh, to write down or to draw what does family mean? And so that I have that as a part of the, the photo exhibit. Hopefully we'll be able to like put that together someday soon, but yeah. And people can see some of these photos on your website. Yes. Yeah. So this year, 2019 is also a very special year and auspicious year for Baha'is around the world because we'll be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of the Bab, the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. Celebrations will be taking place in late October around the world to celebrate his life, his teachings, his legacy, and his sacrifice. To commemorate this occasion, you're organizing a photo art piece titled 750, which is part of an, an art exhibition at the Art in Response to Violence conference in Chicago. Could you share a bit more about this project and the significance behind the name 750? Yeah, so this is a, a collaborative photo project where I'm inviting many different photographers and I'm asking the photographers to take portraits of individual candles being held by different people. The goal is to take 750 portraits and put it together in some sort of collage. And the reason why I chose 750 is because, you know, for those that don't know the story of the Bob, who is the forerunner, he's the prophet founder of, of the Bobby faith, but then the forerunner who foretold that Baha'u'llah was coming. He was actually martyred and he was killed by 750 rifles. And so uh, when I was thinking about this conference, when I got the invitation to submit an art piece, I was thinking, okay, art in response to violence. Well, for me, this in response to the violence that the Bob experienced, um, I thought holding a candle with 750 different people, which will be like a symbolic um, gesture, I guess you could say, of his legacy of the uniting of humanity because the Bob taught about the oneness of humanity and he taught about the unity of the world. And um, so I, I wanted, I wanted the photographers to take pictures of a candle being held and the candle then also represents the time when the Bob was in prison in Maku, uh, which is a city in, in Iran. And uh, during that time when he was imprisoned, he, you know, he suffered so much and he wasn't even given a candle. So he was in complete darkness. And so to me, this light is to, to sort of remind us and connect us to, to his suffering. But, you know, the legacy that Bobby faith, like I said, is, and, and, you know, it's the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. So it's much a part of the Baha'i history is really all about diversity and unity and peace and justice and oneness. 
So I, I really wanted to invite all different kinds of photographers of different races, different ethnicities, different um, levels of expertise um, and, and different interests so that we could all work on this together. So I'm really excited. I have someone who's from Hungary who's participating, someone from Canada and someone from Israel and various uh, individuals that are from the United States and some people that are professional photographers and some that are just starting out and they're like, I really want to participate, but I'm not really that experienced. And so I just want to encourage everybody, like everyone can take part. And how can listeners get involved? Are you still looking for photographers? Sure. You can contact me on my website. Just send me a note or um, on Facebook, look me up, Nancy Wong Photography. My website is uh, nancymwong.com. Just reach out to me and just say, hey, I I'd love to take photos for this project. We'll also include those uh, those links on um, the write-up that's associated with this podcast episode. So before we bring this interview to a close, looking into the future, Nancy, could you share where you hope to be as a photographer in 10 or 15 years' time? You've already mentioned some of the projects you're working on that you want to be working on in the future. Um, are there any other cool ideas in the pipeline? Yeah, I started and then I kind of paused part of it this time. Um, I started a project that's called She, comma, the Artist. I would like to take photographs of women artists all over the world. Um, and then I also have another, a couple of other projects that I'm thinking about that involve portraiture work with Asian women. Oh, there's another project I thought would be really interesting, which is taking photographs of human organs, um, because I have this idea that uh, we can actually talk to our bodies and our organs when we're not well and really cultivate a relationship to help it heal. And um, I don't know what that will mean, but it'd be really fascinating to be able to take photographs of a live live heart, one that's actually still pumping. Yeah. I don't know. Just because I don't know what my body parts always look like. Like if you talk, if I have to talk to my liver, I'm not exactly sure what my liver looks like. (laughs) Anyways, it sounds a little silly, but I was talking to someone who's an integrative um, health practitioner and he was like, wow, I totally get what you're talking about. Well, when you were talking about organs... I was thinking about how our inner body is, our, you know, everything is so the, so similar. Yeah. All of our organs are kind of the same. It's the outer perception or the, the look that we have outside that kind of defines us. But inside, we're all yeah. the same. So that was I, what I was thinking of when you mentioned Ooh, that. Oh, that's a great uh, insight. Yes, thank you. Well, as far as your question <laughs> about 10, 15 years from now, I just, I really hope that I could just keep doing more of this kind of work. You know, I think for every artist that's doing it, seriously it's always a little tricky like how do you balance uh work so that you can make a livelihood i mean even in the process of applying for grants for projects you still have to really plan for it you have to still pay the bills you have to pay for rent you have to buy food you know like so all those kinds of things it takes time to cultivate a a a lifestyle that can that can you know support what it is that you want to do So I'm not exactly sure what will happen 10 to 15 years from now, but my hope is that I can continue doing more of this kind of work and to really see that people, that it's beneficial, you know, that it benefits humanity. I have no, I have no doubt that whatever you do will benefit humanity. Nancy, on behalf of the team at Baha'i Teachings and Cloud9, I want to thank you for allowing us to have this precious time together. I feel like many of our listeners would relate to your journey as an artist. And I want to congratulate you on how far you've come and encourage you to keep going. Thank you so much, Shadi. All the best. And we look forward to hearing about what you get up to next. Okay, cool. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Baha'iteachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles.